All right, so today on uh, this video, we're going to talk about the pearls and pitfalls of the fast exam. My name is Jared Marks, and I'm going to talk you through here some things that I've seen users um, make mistakes on in the fast exam over the years. I think the fast exam is one of the most commonly used ultrasound modalities or applications within the emergency room, but I think that uh, a lot of times we make mistakes, uh, simple, easy mistakes, simply because we don't know some of these things. So. Um, I'd like to show those to you today and hope, hopefully you find them helpful. These are just some general pitfalls. We all know that ultrasound is operator dependent and obese patients are difficult. One additional uh, regular difficulty we have on a fast exam is that patients can get subcutaneous air from large pneumothoraces or a uh, airway injury and subcutaneous air is going to prevent imaging of the deeper structures. Unfortunately, I don't have any examples of that simply because once you feel that crepitus on their chest wall, it, um, it's essentially impossible to image anything below, so I've never obtained those. However, if you were to get this, um, you would see a hyperechoic line uh, with just um, irregular appearance behind it. Maybe some, um, it'd be hyperechoic, but not going to be that helpful to you. So here's the pearls and pitfalls we're going to discuss. No need to go through and memorize each one of these because we're going to go through these individually. And uh, like I said, hopefully you find these helpful so you don't call that, you know, call a uh, false finding uh, positive for free fluid or vice versa. So uh, let's go ahead and look here. So one of the biggest things we need to always think of is the rib shadows, especially when we are looking at the uh, upper quadrants. We're going to be dealing with these a lot. So here we can see a rib shadows right here. And then we can see the shadow coming down right here from it. And so as what happens is a lot of people will get this image and they'll say, well, this is a negative study. Uh, and technically this would be an equivocal image, meaning you can't make a correct interpretation. So right here, you do have the hepatorenal space for the majority of that. And you could say, well, there's no fluid there. But the problem is, is right here, you can't make a call. And there could be subtle fluid that's hanging out there. So you really need to work around these rib shadows and make sure that you see the entire hepatorenal space and you need to do some fanning but you also need to visualize underneath each one of these ribs and it's really not that difficult uh, you can have the patient take a deep breath push that kidney down make sure you visualize that area you can drag the um, probe one way and angle the opposite for instance you know drag towards the feet and then angle back up towards the head or drag towards the head and angle back towards the feet um, Additionally, you can rotate the probe so it matches the rib spaces and look through those. Um, that gets a little difficult if you're using a curvilinear like we are in this image, um, but that is an option and, and easy to do. And also, you could switch to a phased array. I don't like to do that simply because you lose some image quality um, with your lateral resolution, but staying with a curvilinear probe like this uh, is definitely easy. Just make sure you fan through the space uh, decently and, and look around those rib shadows. And so the reason why that's important is because findings are often very subtle. So this image here, I'm going to give you a second to look at it, but this is positive for free fluid. And I want you to see if you can see that entire space, because if you look at that, I think some of you will be able to find it in certain areas. Um, but here's the entire free fluid. Now, this is a little bit of a hazy picture, but this is not an uncommon picture for what we're going to get on a fast exam. And imaging the lower inferior pole of the liver which is right down here is going to be one of our first parts we want to see because we have that fluid that's accumulated there and that's going to be one of our more sensitive areas initially so as the fluid comes up say from uh, the pelvis or as the patient's place of pine even coming over from the left or from the spleen um, it's going to collect typically at the inferior pole of the liver or kidney whichever is most inferior also referred to as the pericolic gutter and then eventually it will spread up and it will start um, going between the kidney and the liver, which we see up in this area. But that's usually a little later. Uh, you know, a good, um, somebody with uh, good skills would be able to find that. Uh, some, but if you look further down, you'll be able to see all this area here too um, and find that a little bit earlier. So we're going to watch that in a video. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. So this is the same patient, and if you look, you know, it could be easy, especially right there. Um, I'm going to see if I can try to pause it here for a minute. 
right where the rib shadow is. So this is what we talked about here, right? This is a rib shadow or rib giving us a little bit of shadowing. And we could look, get this image and say, well, that's a negative study and when it's really not. And then you look here as we fan through, we're seeing that, that fluid. So that's why it's important to work around those rib shadows and really get an idea of what's going on in that space. And come down and get this inferior pole of the liver uh, like we saw in the other. All right, so now we're going to look at the left upper quadrant. So the left upper quadrant's a little bit different than the right upper quadrant. So in the right upper quadrant, you know, the, the, the textbook shot is the hepatorenal space for fluid. Now, like I said before, you can see fluid earlier at the inferior pole of the liver and kidney often, especially if it's coming up from the pelvis as they lie supine. But in the left upper quadrant, you know, the spleen really has to be bathed in fluid completely before you're going to see fluid between the uh, kidney and the spleen. That spleen's smaller, so it's, um, it's got less space that it's occupying and more fluid can collect there before you're going to see, appreciate that space. But what you can see is that the fluid uh, is going to kind of collect in a couple places first. It's going to collect back here and around the pole of the uh, spleen. And it's off the image here on this uh, single image. But it's up in here now you can see i'm using a phased array here so it has been used um, uh, it just depends on what you like but i do like the curvilinear a little bit better um, but we do see rib shadows right there and right there so that may have been the issue with um, with this patient now if we look at this closely so this is typically um, on the poles of the spleen is where you're going to get fluid but fluid likes to come and it goes um, Go supersplenic first and say stay subdiaphragmatic. So if you look at that little spot right there that I drew on there, that's actually free fluid. And it's very, very subtle as you can see. But if we can see that diaphragm, then we can appreciate that there's an anechoic strape right next to that hyperechoic diaphragm. And this is when we can pick up that really subtle fluid early on and really be um, really be good at this. So watch for that. I'm gonna take this off here. Uh, just another highlight of that image right there. So remember, around the left upper quadrant, it typically collects above the spleen, but below the diaphragm. And additionally, you know, the nice thing is about this is if you focus on this area here, you get to see up into the thorax, right? One of the things that we should be looking for too with our patients that are uh, hypotensive is to see if they have a bleed in their, in their thor thorax. All right, so moving on. Now, we all know that Obese patients can be difficult to scan. You may get an image like this. Now, I agree this is a really hazy image, but you know what? This is what we're going to look at, and there's, sometimes there's nothing we can do to improve it just simply because of our patient and some of the obesity that we deal with. Um, but right here, we can see, I'm going to try to circle the liver really well here. So right here, we kind of see the liver come up, and it comes down like that. And we can see our kidney right here. Now, as you guys can see, there's a gap right in there, okay? I'm going to take all that off. So you can see that gap now. Now, the problem with just looking at that gap is it can be mistaken for free fluid. Now, that doesn't always mean just because there's a gap, there's free fluid. So this could be perirenal fat, and in this case, it happens to be. Some clues that might help you to know that it's perirenal fat is it could have echoes in it, which this does. Now that doesn't always mean it's not uh, blood. It could be clotted blood, but it's more likely to be perirenal fat. And then two, if you see um, these lines right here, see that hypercoic line right there and right there. So typically if there's fluid, you will not get two hypercoic lines like that. You would get the liver going and then it would just end. And then you'd have the anechoic fluid and then you'd see your kidney again. And it might be a little hypercoic on that kidney, but not, not like it is here, or would not be hypercoic on the edge of the liver like it is here. So go ahead and look at that one more time. That's uh, perinephric fat in this patient and is not free fluid. All right, we're gonna move on. There's just a highlight of that again. Now we're gonna come to another thing I've seen mistaken for free fluid often is when we get up around the kidney, it's not a smooth, it is a smooth surface, but it's a curved surface. And because it's a curved surface, we can have, um, you know, an ultrasound beam come in and some of it's returned. 
or comes back up and is returned. But some of it comes down and is deflected. And so is what starts to happen, if you guys haven't, uh, in the physics lecture I talk about this a little bit, but here, this space right here, is at, does not have any uh, ultrasound waves going through it, and it creates that area that looks darker. So let me take that all off. And you see that area that looks darker, and that can be mistaken for free fluid, and that is not. That's edge artifact. And that's going to happen typically on curved edges. Um, if you do oculars, you'll see it there. You'll definitely see it around your kidneys if you do enough fast exams or renal exams. So just be cognizant of that, that uh, black stripe right there does not always mean fluid and you really got to pay attention to it is it edge artifact and like I said it's going to be kind of at your angle uh, like we see here this is an angled area and it's going to it's going to allow stuff to come down and be deflected away from going back towards the probe that the natural uh, reflection or diffraction of that is going to be away from the probe so we see here just a highlight of that same space and just remember that that is not free fluid. Now, in the left upper quadrant, we can also see bowel. And bowel can be mistake, has been mistaken uh, multiple times that I've seen for free fluid. Now, what we can do is we can see that here, it looks fairly contained. And we can also see the hyperechoic bowel wall, inner bowel walls. And so the fluid, remember, fluid conforms to spaces. So it doesn't like to take shapes like this does. If we look at this, this looks nice and round. It is within the bowel and it's conforming to the bowel, but it's distending it and creating that space there. Whereas if we had free fluid, it would be kind of surrounding the spleen and necess wouldn't, you know, um, wouldn't necessarily create its own space. It's going to conform to what it can. So be, you won't typically see that in the right upper quadrant. I don't know that I've ever seen it, but definitely since the spleen's smaller, I've seen it a lot in the left upper quadrant, seen a lot of uh, newer users mistaken that for free fluid. Additionally, uh, another mistake I see often is that, you know, this is operator dependent, but when you go to the bladder, a lot of people set their depth way too shallow. So remember, when we are looking, our area of interest is typically going to be this box here. And as well, so it's the middle third, and then the middle third here. And so what we want to do is have the back of the bladder wall be right here, and then down in this space, we want to be able to see posterior to it and see if there's any fluid. So let me go ahead and take those off. And if you look at this image, uh, keeps all that on just a moment. Our bladder, our bladder wall is way down here and we definitely don't see deep to it. And so there's no way to determine if there's free fluid on this one. So let's go ahead and move forward. And so we see something with better depth <coughs> set here. But the problem with this is the the deep gain is too bright and so you'll miss small amounts of fluid now again we're talking physics here um, I never appreciated how much physics actually pay part of some of this at least having a basic understanding and that is you know an ultrasound beam traveling down over here loses strength as it goes it's it's absorbed and it's reflected and everything and so we see here we have kind of a, a uh, isochoic region but when we come here and we hit this so a, a beam hits here and hits the bladder hits all this fluid it comes down and there's a large amount of ultrasound beams that have not been absorbed they've not been deflected and they're hitting this posterior wall so a large amount come back to the probe and they confuse the machine and the machine interprets that as a large structure a lot of ultrasound beams coming back so it gives you this larger intensity and brighter area that is your is so bright back here that you will miss small amounts of free fluid so you really need to adjust what they call the time gain compensation or your deep or your far field gain uh, which is easy to do um, on any machine all right additionally if you know sometimes we're we've got great nurses we're working with and they're they're moving along as we're moving along evaluating these patients and a lot of times you know they're either ga gathering um, urines from the patients or they're put placing foley's most often uh, in these patients and if we're doing a fast exam and we look at the pelvis and the bladder is empty either from a foley or from the patient urinating you this is automatically an equivocal study you cannot call their it negative for free fluid in the pelvis because you've lost your window into the pelvis and just like this one we see a foley bulb here now even though the foley bulb is right here it is not uh, allowing us to see deep 
into the pelvis. And so if we can't see deep into the pelvis, we can't look into those gravity dependent portions of the pelvis and we can't determine if there's free fluid. So if you're seeing this, you've got to really, um, you got to understand that this is an equivocal study and it, you cannot determine if there's fluid or not. Now, one thing you can do is you could uh, use sterile saline and fill the bladder back up and clamp it and then shoot your, do your fast and then uh, take all that fluid back out. Uh, but obviously that's some a uh, few more steps. I would encourage you to go ahead and do this view of the pelvis before they get the Foley in um, and uh, see if there's any free fluid down in that pelvis. Additionally, we see here, this is a female. We can appreciate the bladder um, right over here. And then our uterus here with the endometrial stripe. And then we see this large area of anechoic area or anechoic area and but we see um, some internal echoes in that and so when you start seeing that that is typically clotted blood now a lot of times if it's a little later you'll see it and it will look like it's liver here it doesn't quite look like it's taken on liver it's probably not as organized yet but there's definitely some um, echoes within this anechoic region and that's all clotting blood so pay attention closely because clotted blood may throw you and you may not appreciate the the act or um, that it's there simply because it's not anechoic all right when we talk about lung sliding so just real quick when we look here here is the pleural line right there remember that and if we look there and watch it, we don't see that moving or shimmying back and forth or the ants on the log that some people refer to. Um, it just is pretty still. Now remember, absence of lung sliding does not mean that you have a pneumothorax. Now, presence of lung sliding rules out a pneumothorax at that spot, but absence does not rule it in. And so this can be represented, this can be due to breath holding. Uh, the patient may have a pleural bleb or they could have had a previous pleurodesis. Um, this patient here, I do recall, had a pleurodesis, and so this is why they were did not have lung sliding. Now remember, if you find a lung point, um, which I'll try to get a video up of that, that is pathognomonic for a pneumothorax, and I'll go over why that is in the other video. But a lung point is pathognomonic. The absence of lung sliding is not ind indicative of a pneumothorax. Um, you got to remember that there's other things that can cause it, but you will, if you do have a pneumothorax, it should not be present, at least at that region. And, um, but it can represent breath holding, a pleural bleb, or previous pleurodesis. This is just an MO demonstration of that. As you see, um, as people refer to the barcode sign, we look here at the bottom of the screen, um, right in this region. You know, here's our, let me take that off. Here's the pleural line right there. And just like above the pleural line, we don't see um, any movement we, and we don't see it down here in this region. Um, that does not mean that they have a pneumothorax. It just means um, that there is absence of lung sliding. And again, that can be breath holding, pleural bleb, uh, pleurode previous pleurodesis. It can be a pneumothorax, but you got to really search for that lung point to determine that. Uh, <clears throat> so we all talk about... Um, Abdominal obesity can make it difficult to get that sub xiphoid. So here is a common image I see people get, and then they call this negative, and then they move on for the cardiac view. You know, really, I don't think there's a pericardial effusion here, but I can't say that for certain. Uh, this is a really limited view, and it's really difficult. So the more abdominal obesity I have or gastric air, it's going to make this an impossible view to obtain sometimes. And so don't be afraid, especially if you know to do a cardiac ultrasound, uh, put the probe up over on the parasternal long axis and look for that fluid uh, just deep to the left ventricle. Um, and remember, if you try for an apical, it's got to be a rather large um, uh, pericardial effusion before you can see it on an apical. Essentially, it has to be circumferential. But 
If you're getting a view like this, go ahead and try another cardiac view. Just because you're doing a fast does not mean you can't look at the heart in other ways because this that is actually part of the exam. And remember, too, part of the fast or doing this cardiac view, especially in patients that may have been in a single uh, motor vehicle accident, elderly patient, maybe they passed out. Maybe the EF is really bad. And so you might want to get a better idea of what their ejection fraction looks like. And if you're getting a view like this, uh, you shouldn't be making any decisions based off of that. So once again, here's just the, uh, the points we went over today. I, helpful, I hope that this has been helpful to you. They're just little mistakes I've, I've probably made and seen others make through the years. And um, I think it's a way to you know, up our game and, and be able to take care of our patients a little bit better in trauma. Uh, feel free to shoot me any questions or, uh, you have, and I'll try to respond to those comments. Um, I hope you found this helpful.